Hello and thank you to the, all the reporters joining us today for the release of a major new study from the Ramazzini Institute who has just completed the largest animal study evaluating radio frequency radiation exposures at levels mimicking base station cell tower limits of radiation. I am Theodora Scarato, Executive Director with the Environmental Health Trust, a nonprofit virtual think tank and public education organization. We are pleased to be hosting this online press conference with Dr. Fiorella Belpoghi, Director of Research for the Ramazzini Institute, who is Senior Pathologist from Carpi, Italy, and who has advised the European Parliament and World Health Organization. She is joined with our other experts here in the United States to discuss the new study being released today by Environmental Research, an L. Siever publication. Additional information is available on our website, www.ehtrust.org, and this call is being recorded. We'll also be discussing the findings of the draft U.S. National Toxicology Program study on cell phone radio frequency radiation. We'll take your questions after Dr. Belpoghi summarizes the findings and we hear brief remarks from our panel of distinguished scientists. I am pleased to begin the online news conference by introducing Dr. Fiorella Belpoghi, Director of Research of the world-renowned Ramazzini Institute. Dr. Belpoghi. Hello. Um, I am very pleased to participate to this uh, press release uh, because we work at about 10 years in order to produce uh, this data. And uh, we uh, wanted to, to perform this study um, at the end of the uh, last century, when Cesare Maltoni was still alive. We were already organizing our laboratory in order to build the exposure system uh, that could uh, reproduce uh, the human counterpart uh, of uh, the exposure to the uh, cell towers uh, antenna. So um, uh, first uh, uh, we, we worked uh, with uh, uh, technicians from uh, uh, the uh, northern Italy, the Teseo company that is also working in high technology for the United States uh, uh, NASA, so it's a very qualified one, Teseo, and uh, we were also inspected by um, people from NIST in the United States in order to validate our exposure system that is, uh, is planned in order to have a realistic exposure very similar to the human counterpart, uh, including uh, uh, intensity of uh, the field uh, of uh, 50 volt meter, 25 and 5. So um, these are values that are very close to the ones that are accepted uh, for what I know in the United States, but also very close to the one or si similar or equal to the one present uh, in our regulation here in Italy. Here in Italy we have six volt meter during the 24 hours in a day, so very similar uh, exposure. And what we have found, I have to tell you that um, our study is not yet concluded. We have examined all brain and heart uh, of uh, the exposed and contra groups uh, animal, about uh, 2,500 uh, animals, and uh, we decided to, to run to do that because in 2016, we were very much impressed by the publication of the results of the National Toxicology Program. At that time, all the control group and IDOS group was already evaluated, and we had at that time already seen the increase of this rare type of tumor, that is the heart schwannoma. Schwannoma is a tumor of the Schwann cell, that are the uh, cells that cover the nerves and are the same kind of cells that were seen 
in some epidemiological studies. In Italy in particular, uh, a manager of a company was compensated for an occupational disease because he, develop, he developed a schwannoma of the facial nerves um, associated to the strong use for uh, four, six hours a day of uh, cordless or uh, mobile phone. So the two facts, the finding of the National Toxicology Program and the epidemiological findings led us uh, to publicly uh, announce uh, our results and to publish them. So uh, I, I think that it is very important to mention that it is not the first time that we found uh, the same uh, results uh, studying in rats uh, different compounds. This happened also for a, a, a very diffuse uh, spread chemical that is benzene. Everyone know, knows that benzene is a carcinogenic agent, but at that time in the 80s, we and the National Toxicology Program found a very rare tumor, the Zimbar gland tumor in rats exposed to benzene. And there was a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, noise about these findings that was also mm, trying to discredit the studies and uh, uh, not to taking them into account. So nowadays we know very well that benzene is a strong carcinogen, and unfortunately, we use it so in a huge amount that now we have still a lot of this compound in different products, and we are still exposed. So we were wrong in the past, and I think that these findings have the role to <coughs> announce to companies, to regulators, to policymakers to scientists that the hazard exists. So it is not my role now to take, uh, to take measures. My role was to be sincere with the public and to announce what I have seen together with the National Toxicology Program scientists. Now we have to ask people to, take caution, to be cautious with these uh, devices to avoid them used by, by children, for example. Don't use when you are pregnant and your baby in, 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 uh, could be exposed. Don't use clothes to your uh, babies during lactation. I have seen pictures of mothers lactating their children that use the phone in the same time. So also to have a use when we need it. Don't play with iPad or phones when it is not necessary. And again, I am sure that the companies could improve their device, for example, with headphones that are easy, easy to be used, not like they are now. And I, I mean wire at the phone, because the other ones are dangerous like the phone. And also the emission from the antenna, should they be in some way improved from the point of view of human health? Because now we have seen a lot of resources employed in empowering the signal, in giving more performance to our devices, but never in the light to protect uh, human health. So the message of the Ramazzini Institute to the public is we have seen a low hazard. It is not a very strong hazard, but 7 billion of people are exposed. So the people that could be affected by lesions or diseases by radiofrequency could be thousands and thousands. So um, our appeal is uh, please uh, precaution about uh, these devices. And again, I would like to underline that the resources that we have used for performing these 
um, big experiment, the hugest ever performed on uh, on animals, uh, on such uh, an amount of animals, and on uh, uh, cell towers emission, uh, was uh, uh, funded um, in part by public fund here in Italy, Bank Foundation. And well, we want to thank citizens. you very much for these remarks now, and it's time for us to move on to Dr. Melnick, who was the senior toxicologist who did devise this study for the National Toxicology Program. We're grateful to you, Dr. Belpoggi, for your work. Uh, Dr. Melnick, uh, we'd like to hear from you now with your comments on these studies. Okay. Uh, thank you, okay. Dr. Davis. Okay. So I just want to point out that the Ramazzini study comes from one of the world's top cancer research institutes. And Dr. Belpoggi is a renowned pathologist, and her support team consists of individuals who are experts in conducting and evaluating experimental carcinogenicity studies. I have visited that facility and was impressed by the people and the working conditions of that institute. So as reported by Dr. Belpoggi, in the Ramazzini studies in which rats were exposed lifetime to GSM modulated radio frequency radiation at field strengths of 5 to 50 volts per meter, there was a significant increase in schwannomas of the heart in male rats exposed at the 50 volt per meter uh, level compared to controls. In addition, there were increases in precancerous Schwann cell hyperplasias. And I call these precancerous because these are abnormal growths. They are increases in cell numbers which have the potential to convert to benign and then cancerous lesions. So I've looked at the combined incidence of the schwannomas and the precancerous Schwann cell hyperplasias and found that to be highly significant. Uh, people familiar with uh, p-values, this had a p-value of less than 0.01, meaning that there was a one, less than 1% probability that this result is due to chance. So these results identify Schwann cells of the heart as a target of RF radio frequency radiation in rats. The increase in schwannomas and precancerous lesions of the heart in the Ramazzini study are consistent with the results from the NTP study and demonstrate that these, which are proliferative effects in the cancer process, are a reproducible finding. And reproducibility in science strengthens our confidence in the validity of observed effects. Speaking of the NTP, just for a second, uh, the peer review of NTP's technical reports of radio frequency radiation in rats and mice will be taking place next week at NIEHS in Research Triangle Park. But a another important feature of the Ramazzini results is that even the highest field strength used in that study, 50 volt per meter, is actually lower than the Federal Communications Commission's permissible exposure limit for the general population and is more than five times lower than the FCC's permissible limit for occupational exposures. Clearly, the FCC's exposure limits need to be revisited. In the IARC evaluation of radio frequency radiation in 2011, in which I was a participant, the expert panel concluded that a causal interpretation was possible for increases in brain cancers and acoustic neuromas. These are vestibular schwannomas that have been observed in long-term cell phone users. Uh, Dr. Hardell, I'm sure, will speak more about that since his studies were instrumental in that decision. But at the time of the IARC evaluation, there was no positive carcinogenicity data available from studies in conventional laboratory animals, the type typically used by NTP or the Ramazzini Institute. The concordance now seen between rats and humans and cell type affected by radio frequency radiation strengthens the animal to human association. Therefore, I believe it's time for regulatory agencies to make strong recommendations for precautionary measures, to update their 20-year-old guidelines, and to strengthen regulations to be more public health protective. And also, because the results from the Ramazzini Institute and the NTP 
occurred despite claims that this type of radiation is incapable of causing any adverse effects. I believe it would be irresponsible to implement any new wireless technologies in neighborhoods where people would be continuously exposed before thorough evaluations are made of potential adverse health effects. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Melnick. Dr. David Carpenter, a physician and epidemiologist and director of the State University of New York at Albany Institute for Health and the Environment. Dr. Carpenter? Thank you. There are several implications of these studies. First of all, there is strong evidence from people that use cell phones intensely for long periods of time that there's an increased risk of gliomas of the brain and acoustic neuromas of the auditory nerve, the latter being a type of swanoma. Glial cells and swan cells are part of the same family. So there's clear evidence now that, that the glial family type is a major factor in the, in the response to electromagnetic fields uh, from cell phones and, and from cell towers. Now, I'm a public health physician, which is to say public health is the profession that tries to prevent disease rather than just treating disease once it's occurred, which is standard medicine. So the implications from this study are that there is a danger to individuals that live close to cell towers, so they're being continuously exposed to the radio frequency radiation coming from the cell towers. Now, the exact magnitude of that risk is still not clear because there have been relatively few health studies of people living by cell towers. There are some. But clearly there is a risk documented from people using cell phones and now documented by these animal studies. We should not place cell towers near schools, near uh, residences, we should put them as far away from people as possible. Cell towers direct a beam at the horizon, and so it falls off at the distance as you go further away. Now, there are other implications. One of the things that's very concerning to me is the move to having wireless computer classrooms in schools. Because if you have one router and 20 or 25 kids on a wireless laptop, you have at least this magnitude of intensity of radio frequency radiation. And it's a mini, mini microwave oven. And that's going to have adverse effects on, on the children. Another issue that's really very important is that there's a major movement in pretty much in all countries of the world to develop small cell 5G cell towers that are transmitting antennas and by the nature of this frequency, they have to be placed very close to every home, separated by about 300 meters. These are going to be put on every street in the country. And these are going to continuously expose everybody living nearby and everybody that's simply walking down the street. And that increased exposure is going to increase the risk of cancer and several other diseases that you'll hear about in a moment. I certainly urge that there be government actions. The Federal Communications Commission, as Ron has already said, have standards that are not protective of human health. They must be revisited. Communities and state and local governments also must take action. Now, the good news is that there are ways of having access to modern communications that do not increase your risk of disease. Wired connections don't cause radio frequency radiation. If you have a wired earpiece to your cell phone, if you use a landline rather than a cell phone, if you wire your computer connections in school classrooms, uh, wireless is very convenient, but it comes with a threat to human health. And while none of us are saying we have to do away with it, it can be used safely we need to position cell towers as far away from people as possible, and we need to inform everybody that while these technologies are good, they come with a certain risk as well, and therefore should be used with caution. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Hadell is in now. Oh, I, we're, we're, 
Uh, Dr. Hardell, thank you so much. Um, please go ahead. I, I gave a brief summary and referred to your excellent testimony and the figures there, but I think it would be helpful to hear from you directly as a physician who has treated people with these issues. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I'm a medical oncologist and also epidemiologist uh, doing research on cancer cause, causing agents for several decades, including uh, cellular phones and uh, cordless uh, phones uh, since uh, almost two decades. I was also uh, uh, present at the, or an expert at the IARC uh, meeting in 2011 when uh, radiofrequency radiation was um, uh, evaluated to be a group 2B carcinogen in, in humans. Uh, I made a summary of uh, uh, human studies, and I don't know if you can put on table one on that screen, or is that technically possible? No, Any, anyhow, uh, when we look into human epidemiology, there is a consistent uh, increased risk of uh, glioma, uh, and uh, the results are statistically significant. And uh, this is, of course, of uh, large interest since uh, the same types of tumors comes up in the, both in the NTP study and in the Ramazzini Institute study. And uh, to my mind, it's uh, relatively rare that uh, exactly the same tumors are found in human epidemiology and also in, uh, in laboratory animal studies. So it's uh, a very strong evidence that the radiofrequency really causes this, uh, these types of, of specific brain tumors. And uh, we have also uh, shortly the same find findings for acoustic neurinoma or vestibular schwannoma, which is a tumor located in the inner part of the ear. And actually, there is a good excess of the radiofrequency radiation to that part of the ear, to the ear channel, of course. These tumors are mostly benign tumors in human beings, uh, contrary to the malignant ones in, in, in the animal studies. But these are the same types of tumors, and in human beings, they, they behave like a malignant tumor because due to the limited uh, structure, they will compress uh, adjacent brain uh, structures and also give compression and uh, eventually compression of the brain stem, which uh, will kill persons. Uh, it's, of course, uh, also a problem that they give hearing deficit or even hearing loss. Uh, there will be tinnitus and vertigo, and uh, these uh, symptoms may be for the rest of the life, even if uh, the tumor is, is uh, treated by operation or uh, radiation. So, uh, again, this is a consistent finding from these two studies, replicating human epidemiology studies. And I think uh, these two uh, tumor types and the results combining human studies and uh, uh, animal studies is a breakthrough when we consider radiofrequency radiation to be a human carcinogen group one. It causes cancer. And this must have an implication on our attitude to uh, exposure to radiofrequency uh, uh, radiation. May it be from uh, cellular phones, from uh, cordless phones, or from base stations, or the 5G um, uh, evolution, which is coming up now without any pro proper discussion of medical health risks. And it's notable that there is almost no research in this area, especially in, in um, uh, the United States, although we expose all human beings to, to this. And we can also see that we, we have now an increasing incidence of brain tumors in, in Sweden, especially in the age group uh, with the longest uh, time for use of mobile phones. So this is a consistent finding, again, with uh, the animal studies and the human epidemiology studies. Okay, thank you for now. Well, uh, I, I, w I would say that there is also some interesting findings in uh, the NTP study, uh, which uh, shows uh, an increasing risk for the pituitary tumors. And uh, we can also see that this is a, a tumor type with 
a huge increase in incidents um, like in the United States, but also in, in Sweden. We have looked into the cancer statistics and uh, since uh, uh, the early 2000s there is a steep increase in pituitary tumors and of course that part of the brain, although the tumor is located in the midbrain, it's exposed during uh, the use of, of wireless phones. There's also a very high increase in thyroid cancer uh, in many countries and it cannot only be uh, due to improved uh, diagnostic tools, but uh, we think also that the smartphones, which have, can have up to five antennas, uh, and uh, some of them very close to the thyroid gland, can, can be a part of this, although there are a lack of human studies on that issue. But the cancer statistics show uh, an increasing uh, incidence of thyroid cancer, which is, uh, of course, a problem. So I think that uh, the data from NTP and so far we haven't got the whole picture from Ramazzini Institute, but it, it may indicate that radiofrequency radiation is even a multi-site carcinogen in, in uh, human beings like some other agents that can give um, cancer in different parts of the body. And, and there are indications that it can also it can promote cancer. Existing uh, tumors can be promoted by radiofrequency radiation, like we found and other studies have found that uh, that uh, the acoustic neuronoma tumor is uh, larger in those who have been using the uh, the uh, wireless phone. Uh, but also uh, studies on glioma, as we have done, shows that it can also initiate. It can start. Uh, a glioma tumor with some latency time from first use until the tumor will some decays 20 or 20, 10 or 20 years or more. We have also shown that uh, the most aggressive uh, glioma type, glioma uh, uh, multiforme, uh, has a, a worse prognosis among those who are who are, have been using a wireless phone. That means that the tumor is more aggressive in those persons and it kills them faster than if you haven't used the mobile phone, uh, which is very interesting, but also reflects the biology of the tumor and the, promote, the promotion of, of uh, the tumor by wireless radiation. We have also shown that those who started the use before the age of 20 years have higher risk than the old, older age groups. So there are many parts of this puzzle that now are, are fitting together, taking uh, these latest uh, uh, laboratory studies. Dr. Deborah Davis, visiting professor of medicine at Hebrew University, who chaired the Israel Institute for Advanced Study Environmental Health Trust Expert Forum, Forum on Wireless Radiation and Health, when the Ramazzini study was the design was presented. She's formerly a member of the Scientific Advisory Group of the National Toxicology Program. And Dr. Davis is also President of the Environmental Health Trust. Thank you, and thank you all for being on this call, which is being recorded. I'm very sorry that we don't have Dr. Hardell with us right now, and so what I'd like to do is give you a brief summary of his remarks. These remarks from Dr. Hardell can be found on our website and on the website of the National Toxicology Program because he has submitted comments to them on their bioassay, but I'm going to address the relevance of the Ramazzini study. Uh, Dr. Hardell is a physician, and he has remarked to many of us that cases of acoustic neuroma, while they are benign, actually result in disfiguring and disabling consequences to people. For example, surgery to remove an acoustic neuroma, which is a tumor around the hearing nerve, a thickening of Schwann cells. So neuroma is also called Schwannoma. Surgery to remove those tumors can be disfiguring, can result in permanent hearing loss, and can result in losing the ability to smile, to even chew and eat food properly because the entire jaw can be rendered slack because the nerves are often damaged in the process of that surgery. So while we know that the neuroma, also called a schwannoma, is technically benign, its consequences are not benign. Uh, Dr. Hardell, as a physician, of course, has treated this, and he's particularly concerned 
about the human data on glioma, which his team has been developing over the past 20 years. Again, I refer you to his testimony, which was submitted March 12th to the National Toxicology Program and can be found online there as well as on uh, our website. And in that testimony, not only does he note the nature of the acoustic neuroma, schwannoma, he also reports on some very interesting data on changes in patterns of cancer that may reflect increases in uh, cell phone use. And most importantly, he shows us the consequences of, combine, of what we know from the time that the International Agency for Research on Cancer reviewed the evidence, experimental evidence and human evidence on cell phone radiation. At that time, based in large part on some experimental findings and human findings, the International Agency for Research on Cancer concluded that cell phone and other wireless radiation constituted a possible human carcinogen, category 2B, the same category as uh, lead and engine exhaust at that time. Since then, Dr. Hardell and his team and French scientists working with French national data on glioma have reported increased gliomas in those with the longest period of use of, of cell phones. And they have shown consistently that when you have data on persons that have used phones for 10 years or more, you have an increased risk, and the combined meta-analysis that Dr. Hardell and his team have done indicates that the most likely increase is a threefold increased risk for those who use phones on the same side of the head for which, um, where they get their, their tumor. Now, um, I'm not going to go into great detail of, of his work, but I really want to encourage you to look at his submission, and in particular, some graphs that he has developed subsequently concerning the Ramazzini study. Now, the Ramazzini study is fascinating because it uh, showed uh, increases not only in uh, glial cell uh, tumors, but in hyperplasia, both for the brain and for the heart. And hyperplasia is regarded as a precancerous condition, as Dr. Melnick has said. And when you combine the animal data for both the hyperplasia and the tumors, you find a much more significant result than when you look solely at the uh, single tumor alone. And the reasons for combining these are that it is generally understood in toxicology that hyperplasia is a precancerous condition and of indicating an abnormal response and should not be dismissed as a benign condition. So in some, we are seeing growing evidence of concern from both the experimental data that we talked about here today and the human data that uh, Dr. Hardell and his team um, have put together um, for um, the past 20 years. I think at this point we'll stop and uh, invite you to uh, present questions and I'll go back to uh, our executive director, Theodora Scarato, who is going to be handling the call at this point. Hello, I'd just like to check if Dr. Hardell is on the call. Okay, we're going to start our Q&A now. To ask a question, press star 6. And let me... While we're waiting for questions to be put into the queue, um, I'd, I'd like to also add a, a few comments about the relevance of the schwannoma finding in the heart to humans. In fact, uh, there are very, very few cases that have ever been reported in the scientific literature of schwannomas, which is the thickening of nerve cells within the heart. Only 16 cases have been found in the literature, but we really have to ask how many strokes or heart attacks could, in fact, be due to this underlying mass of uh, irregularity within the heart. We know that there's been a big decline in the autopsy rate around the world, and particularly in the United States. 
So it's entirely possible that this could be a factor. In addition, there's been a recent report that I, I find very concerning, that younger Americans um, have not shared in the general drop in deaths uh, from heart, heart disease. Now, we know that obesity, of course, is a factor, and we see growing rates of obesity in younger people around the world. But in the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia, in all of these countries, there has been an increase in hospitalization for heart attack in young adults. And I'm raising this simply as a question because we don't understand why there should be a 4% annual increase in heart attacks in females in Australia, more than a 50% increase in little more than a decade. And I think we need to start to ask about this and whether or not this could be related uh, to uh, cell phones as well as, as, as other factors. One thing that Dr. Hardell has remarked to us all about is the absence of American research on human health in this area. The last American study to be published on brain cancer and cell phone radiation was published in 2002. Despite the fact that there's been other studies done internationally on this topic of the relationship between brain cancer and cell phones in the United States, we have no research funded right now underway on this question at all. We are, as Dr. Carpenter said, flooded with dazzling new technologies that we use that entertain us, that enthrall our children, and the adult market is so fully saturated, but many school districts are now giving kindergartners iPads, and these have never been evaluated, both for how well they work and for their safety. I finally would add that Steve Jobs and the Gates family did not have these devices in their homes, and the issue of environmental research that I am the guest editor of with uh, Dr. Melnick and Dr. Anthony B. Miller um, does include an article just published by Israeli social psychologist Gadi Lessert documenting the array of physical, emotional damage that can occur with these devices. So the exposures in this study are relevant to us today, and we need to think more carefully about it. I want to conclude with letting you know about the French government test agency. The French government has its own frequency test agency, and the U.S. does not. They actually picked uh, of several hundred phones and evaluated them, and they have reported, as is available on our website today, that nine out of ten phones that they tested exceeded the European standard for microwave radiation of a two watts per kilogram. My good friend Frank Clegg, the former president of Microsoft Canada, assures me that the telecom industry knows how to fix these problems, and with a little pressure from the right places, Mr. Clegg says, he has no doubt that they will be able to do just that. We'll now open this up for discussions, and please tell us your name, the media organization you're with, and to whom you're directing your question. Hi, this is Charlie Schmidt calling from Scientific American. Um, I want to know, was the, was the Ramazzini study launched in coordination with the NTP? Was there sort of coordinated planning strategy to do these studies simultaneously? Um, and if so, why was that? Dr. Belpoti? Yes, so uh, I hope to understand well the question. Uh, anyway, you are asking about a possible um, coordination between our institute and the National Toxicology Program. Is that Yeah, but with respect, to, with respect to the NTP study and the Ramazzini study specifically, were, were these studies performed intentionally in tandem with, the other, with each other as part of a coordinated um, we, strategy? We, Yes, we both started the experiment in 2005, but this happened because the, the use of mobile phone was increasingly, is increasing time by time from the end of the last century in a very, very incredible amount. And so both our, our institutes and uh, the National Toxicology Program are um, perhaps uh, the unique big laboratories uh, which uh, study um, the already spread chemical or physical agent in the environment without the purpose of uh, the registration in a particular um, in a particular uh, sector of uh, trade, you know. So uh, the FDA asked 
the National Toxicology Program to perform the study. And in the same period, our citizens here in the area of Bologna from 2000 to 2005 organized a lot of meeting in order to clarify what could be the possible effect on human health of this uh, technology. So we had not uh, any answer for them because uh, the data were very, very insufficient uh, to give uh, an answer. And uh, we decided to ask uh, for, for support to our institution. And we received here in the Emilia-Romagna region the support of our region and of the agency for uh, the prevention in the environment. So we started the study, but then we, uh, for uh, a lot of governmental political reasons, all research was uh, out of the health uh, national system, and so we organized our institution in a cooperative. And so the citizens of our area and some um, no-profit organization um, financed our, our study. So no conflict of interest, but no relationship wanted relationship with the National Toxicology Program. Then we shared uh, the exposure system with them because it's something with very complicated and the technology in the United States was already very much advanced and could, uh, could uh, help us. So we asked for a visit and uh, a person from NIST went to Bentivoglio, visited the laboratory and uh, wrote a report and uh, gave us and to the company Teseo a lot of suggestions in order to improve uh, the exposure system. This was the beginning. Then we conducted the study, we performed the histopathology, we did everything, but there were no contact with the National Toxicology Program on this specific issue. When in 2016 I uh, saw in the internet the report of the National Toxicology Program about the increase of brain tumors and heart tumors, I was very much impressed because just at that time, I am the chief of pathology, I had reviewed um, the uh, tumors of the brain and the heart in the highest dose and in the control group. And comparing the result, I saw that there was an increase of this very rare tumor. So I spoke with my Council of Administrators, and uh, we asked uh, for money to different agencies, and we succeeded in uh, performing uh, um, at least uh, the, pro uh, the process for preparing slides for brain and hearts, and to review them, to have a second opinion review on all the slides from 10 high-level pathologists that confirmed our diagnosis, and then we published the data, and the data are those that you are seeing in our paper. So uh, I have to tell you that the collaboration between the Ramazzini Institute and the National Toxicology Program is a scientific collaboration, very fruitful, that lasts 40 years, from the time of David Roll and Cesare Maltoni. We had always a lot of exchanges in our findings and opinions. And I think that we did together a good service to public health. Thank you, Dr. Belpoggi. Next caller, please identify yourself and the media organization you're with. Thank you. It's Leanne Linick at CBS News. I'm wondering if um, you can explain why uh, brain cancers have been flat, at least in the U.S., and if um, 
there was this danger from the cell phone radiation, why we're not seeing that reflected yet? Um, Dr. Melnick, do you want to comment on that? I can add the following. Um, the latency for brain cancer in the general population has been estimated to be about 40 years, and that's based on the survival data from the atom bomb that ended, uh, dropped at the end of the war in Hiroshima. Those survivors have been followed, and there was no increase in brain cancer in them associated with ionizing radiation until 40 years afterward. There were increases found in leukemias that showed up with, within uh, less than 10 years. But when it came to brain cancer, that did not show up. And now we do understand uh, from studies that have been done on those who were treated with ionizing radiation for ringworm that it does take 40 years for brain cancer to develop after that exposure. Now what Leonard Hardell's data has shown is that when you look at people with the heaviest cell phone use and you compare them to those who uh, do not have brain cancer but are of the same age, same social class, uh, same sex, you find a significant elevation in risk of glioma. And that is why the case control studies are so important here. The absence of an epidemic of brain cancer at this time, the absence of an epidemic of brain cancer at this time is not proof that there is no problem with cell phones, but rather a reflection of the long latency involved in this disease and the fact that there are different causes that may be operating at different times. I, I just want to add a couple of words to that. The, obviously, the latency of disease is uh, very important, but also you must consider who are the groups, the subgroups, for which the cancer rates are being evaluated. If it's a total population, there's a big dilution by people who haven't used cell phones long enough to develop a tumor. Uh, so in, in terms of understanding a population effect, it needs to be linked to the dosimetry. What is the dosimetry in relationship to a cancer outcome? And there has never been a good prediction of that based on a quantitative risk assessment to say, what is the relationship between exposure and cancer risk, and how does that compare with specific exposures in human populations to a predicted risk? Um, I'm sorry, for, could I just follow up um, for a lay audience? Could you break that down when you talk about dissymmetry and... Um, well, well, the dosimetry would be a function of the emissions received by the device and the amount of time at which uh, that device is being used or uh, <clears throat> held next to one's head or received from other sources uh, that also emit. So the dosimetry is the dose times the time of exposure uh, in relationship to a uh, number of years for the latency to have occurred such that a tumor would develop. I have to Thank you. Um, let me add something. There has been a study published by Zada et al. Uh, looking at trends in anatomic location of primary malignant brain tumors in the U.S. from 1992 to 2006. And they did find uh, increases in age-adjusted rates of certain types of uh, brain tumors of the temporal and frontal lobe and the cerebellum. Now, that is not proof that cell phones are involved because trends don't prove what causes them, as we know from the work on lung cancer and smoking. But it is noteworthy at this point. Uh, next question, please. Identify yourself, please. Yeah, hello, is, can you hear me? Hello, this is yep. Susan Shackman at CBS News. Um, in, in very simple terms, can you tell us how rat, how strongly correlated the rat data is to people? Sorry, you're Let me uh, add briefly uh, that all carcinogens that have been identified in humans will also produce it 
in animals when adequately studied. And that's why the preamble to the International Agency for Research on Cancer monograph series makes that statement very clearly, that when we have something that we know causes cancer in people, we can also produce it in animals. So we study animals in order to prevent human harm, not to prove that there's a foundation for it. Let me ask Dr. Melnick if he can elaborate uh, on that. Well, I think another issue is that this is a physical agent. There's no metabolism involved in this. Uh, so there, there's no reason to expect that I can think of that an effect observed in animals would not also occur in humans. But as uh, Dr. Davis just said, every known human carcinogen that has been adequately tested has shown to produce tumors in animals. And approximately one-third of the known human carcinogens were first shown to be carcinogens in animal models. Thank you very much. Let me just add that we, t we study animals to make drugs, so they're relevant for producing drugs. They ought to be relevant for predicting human harm. Next question, please. Hi, my name is Mary Ann Tierney. I'm a registered nurse and EMF educator in North Carolina. Thank you so much for organizing this today. I am um, curious from Dr. Belpoji exactly what is the incidence of the schwannoma that you found? Hello? Yes, uh, um, you can see from the tables in uh, the paper that uh, we have found a 1.5% in uh, May rats of the 50 volt meter treatment group. So it is uh, a 50 volt meter in Italy is just an occasional exposure. It's not uh, an allowed exposure for all uh, people. But schwannomas were also observed in uh, the other groups. Uh, also at the lower dose group, uh, we have found, uh, uh, for example, uh, three schwannoma uh, in the males of the of the, let, let me take my, my glass, <laughs> three schwannoma in the males, nine in females, and again in the um, 25 uh, voltmeter group, uh, one schwannoma in male and one in females. So they were zero in the uh, control group for male, and occasionally we found four uh, that is only 1% anyway in FEMA uh, control group. So uh, as I, I stated before, uh, this, uh, this uh, kind of tumor is very rare in our, in our uh, strain. And rare mean that one percent or one per more than percent uh, is considered as a rare tumor. Um, th this means, uh, this doesn't mean that we have not to see it uh, in uh, the control group. Remember that all carcinogens act uh, improving the carcinogenesis that is also a natural process of the cell. Um, to, to get a cancer, um, there are different factors, and the different factors could be susceptibility. In fact, we show that in our group, not all the male rats got a, a, a schwannoma, but only few of them, because they were susceptible. But uh, these susceptible individuals are also spread in the human population. And again, age could be a factor that affects carcinogenesis. In this case, we have not a difference in the age of uh, control group and treated group. So age didn't play a, a specific role. But uh, there was exposure that was a variable 
that was a controlled variable. Um, you see, when we analyze the data from epidemiology, the criticism usually say, oh, you have a lot of bias because people uh, have different style of life or different food or air or work and so on. Here we have no bias. We have the same food, the same hair, the same water. Everything was the same. Also the genetical pattern was very similar. The unique change was the uh, intensity of the radiofrequency. So we associate this rare tumor, the increase of this rare tumor, that anyway we can observe also in the absence of radiofrequency, because as I said, is, cancer is a multifactorial uh, disease. But uh, we have observed a statistically significant increase associated to the exposure. So this is a, an hazard that we are stating. Risk is another kind of uh, assessment, but we have, we, we as scientists should uh, underline all that, should claim from, for revision of the, uh, the present regulation, because if uh, up to 2011 we said that uh, animal study had limited evidence for carcinogenicity, now we can say that there is sufficient evidence. Thank you very much, Dr. Belpoji. This is Dr. Deborah Davis. Okay, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. I will just make some uh, brief comments. I am an MD and I worked all my life long in cancer epidemiology and in particular on uh, environmental risk factors. So for the case of electromagnetic fields and cancer, a lot has been said already, and I will just limit myself to two comments. One is that quite often epidemiology is presented as negative because the results do not show statistical significance. I know that jargon for um, educated readers, but there are two ways that one cannot see an impact, and one is that often you don't have enough study subjects to see something or enough large number of animals to see an impact. And if you look at the epidemiology of brain tumors, for example, I will take the case of a cephalo study because this was the only study available so far on brain tumors in people aged between 7 and 19 years old, so on children and adolescents. It was done in the Nordic countries and in Switzerland. It's presented as a study showing no impact. But in fact, when you look at the tables and the numbers in the tables, you can see that most of the measure effect, which we call odds ratio, are in fact increased greater than one. So they indicate that there is a risk. But of course, the numbers at the time of cases of brain tumors in kids were not enough to make it to statistical significance. But in that study, the kids who had the longest period of exposure have a statistically significant result, which is not written in the abstract. So I would advise journalists and people when they look at a study, to look very carefully at what the numbers say, maybe more than the words associated with it. Because it has been said today that it takes 40 years to get a brain cancer. But in people exposed very young, 
then it may take less than 50 years. So, of course, we may now start seeing an impact. And the kids 20 years ago were not using cell phones. So it may be really relevant. So I think the biological, clinical significance should be considered as importantly as we consider statistical significance. So I think that's an important point I, I wanted to make. There was another one, but I forgot it. Uh, so um, I think um, I will stop here. But really outline the, the thing that uh, results are important. And we don't have to wait to have an epidemic of cases for results to become statistically significant before we do something. And Thank in fact, for much. the future, I have one last uh, comment. For the future, we have to consider that epidemiology will be in deep trouble because everyone will be exposed to electromagnetic fields from the Wi-Fi, from the cell towers, from the phones. So it will become ever more difficult to find out the difference. And that's really dramatic. And that's where the experimental studies like the NTP and the Ramazzini are really helping. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saskia. We really much appreciate your comments. Uh, let, me, let me add that public health importance and statistical significance are not equivalent, and we would be foolish to think that they are. I appreciate your pointing out that Cephalo's study did, in fact, show an increase, although the authors chose not to discuss it in the way that, that you have just done. Dr. Hardell, do you have any comments to add on this issue of exposures of the young? Yeah, uh, I think it's the, it's, it's a very good uh, point by Dr. Sasko on the CFLU study because actually uh, when uh, uh, they analyzed the data from uh, the mobile phone providers, uh, the operators, there was a stati statistically significant increased risk which they didn't present actually in a uh, in a good manner, as you point out, and uh, it has even been uh, in Sweden uh, presented as a study that doesn't show any increased risk in the uh, children for uh, for brain tumors. And if you now look into the whole scenario, the whole picture with the uh, human data, uh, as I discussed, and uh, the laboratory data, like uh, we know that there are uh, mechanisms how, how the increased risk can uh, can uh, be caused, like the reactive oxygen species, etc. And we have these animal data. Then we have uh, an obligation to protect the children, the young ones, from radio frequency radiation. And uh, I think this is by now uh, more or less a political issue uh, that needs to be uh, taken care of because we have the science now that this is cancer causing and maybe also other health problems. Uh, we don't know if this is a tip of an iceberg and uh, there are other health problems which actually are indicated in, in uh, other studies. And also in the NTP study, there's a very interesting thing that uh, maybe you could comment on and it's the, the endocarditis. I mean, the, in, the, in the heart that there was an effect in, uh, in uh, the animals and how does that translate to human beings? Uh, people go, uh, they wear the, the, especially men wear the, the smartphone uh, in the pocket, uh, close to the to the heart, and uh, I would have a like to have a comment on that issue. Is this a problem for human beings or not? Yeah. I don't know if Dr. Melnick has some. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm here. Uh, yes, there was cardiomyopathy, a disease of the heart of the right ventricle, in the NTP study. Uh, this was something that was observed in both male and female rats. It was one in which the severity of the lesion increased with the increasing dose and the incidence increased with the increasing dose level. Uh, yes, this is a concern. Uh, and also by the fact that I, I looked at some of the individual animal pathology data for uh, one of the uh, modulations and notice that 
uh, cardiomyopathy was a, listed as a cause of death or contributed or cause of death in uh, approximately 20% of the rats that died during the two years of exposure. So yes, that is a concern. How to translate it to humans, uh, I haven't done that. But uh, I, I would say holding that cell phone in a shirt sure pocket next to the heart uh, would be a, a risk factor. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, I, I would like to comment on that, that we have actually looked into the Swedish uh, hospital data on myocarditis, myocarditis, you say it like that maybe, uh, and we see an increasing incidence in men, which is quite obvious uh, during the last decade, but less, less so in, in females. So we are going to look more into more detail mm. uh, into, into that issue because uh, if the incidence is increasing and we have the animal data, there might be a problem. We have also these uh, anecdotal uh, stories about people who get uh, heart problems from the radio frequency radiation, and of course we have this uh, by Professor Paul the the calcium uh, effect the, by the of the calcium transportation, and calcium is vital for the for the heart rate at least. So yeah. there are intriguing issues regarding the heart. Martin Paul has an article coming out in Environmental Research in which he documents the effect of cell phone radiation on voltage-gated calcium channels and its ability to interfere with the way normal drugs perform. Um, we have time for just two more questions, so may I ask you to identify yourself, and we'll take the next questioner, please. Um, perhaps I am the next questioner? Yes. Okay, this, yes. Is, this is Marnie Glazer, and this might be a reach, but I'm just wondering if anyone has gone back and looked at C.K. Chu's um, research in which decades ago he found an awful lot of cancers in rats, but did not really report it as a concern because there were so many different kinds of cancers. Mm -hmm. Has anyone looked at that in relation to these studies and what is being found now? I, this is Dr. Hadell. I think this is a very important question because, as I see it already, Dr. Shu showed that uh, radio frequency can be a multi-site carcinogen. It could be a promoting effect, so it could promote uh, different types of cancer. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not too confident to, to tell how, but this was discussed uh, actually at the IARC meeting in 2011, and one raised concern was uh, that uh, it gave a multitude of, of uh, different cancer types, so there was no clear pattern mm -hmm. that there was a single type of cancer which stood out, but it was observed uh, exactly as you say, that uh, there are different types of cancer coming up. I don't know if uh, Dr. Melnick has more comments on that. In, in the NTP technical report, they do provide a listing of uh, total tumors, total malignant tumors. Uh, but w w one of the difficulties in that type of analysis is that there are a large number of spontaneous tumors that develop in these animal models. So what I would think would be more meaningful is to select the potential target sites and look at those and not ex include those tumor sites that have high spontaneous rates because it will uh, block the ability to see an effect. Uh, but w one other point, uh, since you're talking about multi-sites for effects of uh, cell phone radiation, uh, a comment that I provided on the NTP report and that I'll be presenting next week is that, in my view, the prostate gland is also a target organ for proliferative effects of uh, radio frequency radiation. This is the combination of tumors, adenomas and carcinomas, as well as uh, epithelial hyperplasias, which are increased in the exposure groups compared to the controls. And I, I will be urging NTP to identify this as a target uh, site found in that study. And I will be adding comments about the testis because we've done work uh, with Masood Seferamanish on the testicular proteome 
which is also uniquely susceptible to exposure and uh, does absorb the highest exposure when a phone is, is in the pocket. We have time, uh, I think, just for one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap up. And I would encourage you to submit further questions to media at ehtrust.org, um, and that we will be happy to share the questions with our expert scientists, and we're very grateful to have them still on the line with us. We have one more question. Please identify yourself. You've just been unmuted. All right. Um, a 510 error code? Nope. All right. I think that we are going to end I, the call. Can, yes? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would like to, Annie Sesco, I would like to say one word about the issue of total tumors. It's true that some tumors occur spontaneously in some specific rats. But nevertheless, if we see more of these so-called spontaneous tumors in the exposed than in the non-exposed, I think it's also relevant. Because quite often, when we want to extrapolate what we see in animals versus what we will see in humans, for many carcinogens, they have been different tumor sites. So I think all tumors have to be taken into account. And I think in the NTP study, there are more total tumors in the exposed than in the non-exposed. I think it's an information, and it has some relevance. I yeah, completely yeah, agree, yeah. and I think Dr. Pelpoji is going to complete her analysis of her work. She will be able to tell us after they finish that work, whether she finds something similar. Uh, Dr. Hardell, do you want to add a closing remark? Yeah, well, I was yes to, to add that uh, TCD in dioxin is uh, regarded to be, by now to be a multi-site uh, carcinogen and evaluated as a group one uh, carcinogen by IAC. So let's see what comes out from uh, more analysis of the Ramazzini Institute paper or study. Yes, thank again, you. I want to thank Dr. Belpoji and her colleagues at the Ramazzini Institute, uh, Dr. Hardell in Sweden, um, uh, Dr. Melnick, and uh, Dr. Carpenter, who have been leaders in this field for some time. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. Thank you to all the reporters. Please send anything further to media at ehtrust.org and look for our website where we'll be posting additional materials relating to the very important study of the Ramazzini Institute. The website Thank again is much, Thank you. Thank All right. Thank bye you bye. very much, Debra. Oh, bye-bye.